Good evening, everyone. Um, I guess uh, it was, uh, I'm glad I'm not crying. I had a little break after Dick's wonderful introduction to wipe back the tears, so that's good. So I can kind of get right into this. But thank you very much, uh, everyone, for coming tonight. So there are a lot of reasons why someone might come to Orange County. Uh, you might come for Disneyland. You might come for the beautiful beaches. You might come for UC Irvine. Or if you're like me, you might come to get your luck restored re, uh, by touching the boot on John Wayne at the John Wayne Airport. So if you ever wondered why it's all shiny there, that's mainly from me uh, and trying to renew my good luck. Um, but only a few of us get the call from Fountain Valley. And uh, for me, the call from Fountain Valley came from Ron Linsky. And it was a call that said, David, it's time to come and give your presentation to the Research Advisory Board. Because one of my first grants as an assistant professor was from NWRI. And I dutifully came to Orange County. My first trip to Orange County wasn't to Disneyland, wasn't to the beaches. I didn't even see John Wayne on that trip. It was to give a presentation in front of the research advisory board in a windowless hotel room in the basement of a, of, of a, a nice establishment close to the airport. And I presented some of the data that we had collected. Uh, we were starting to get interested in the topic of steroid hormones in wastewater effluent and recycled water. And these are some of the data that I presented at that first uh, meeting. And, um, and you can see, even back in 1998, I guess this grant started in 1995, and it took us a few years before we got reasonable measurements. We were very interested in this question of trace organic compounds that are in wastewater and how they might end up finding their way into recycled water system. Now, any of you who know, who've ever been uh, affiliated with NWRI or who've had the pleasure of being funded by NWRI, know what it's like for an assistant professor to come to the research advisory board <laughs> and to be asked questions about their research. Um, it keeps you on your toes to have such a strong uh, group of people, both in terms of personality and intellect, uh, giving, leading an inquisition into the veracity of your science. And um, I took that as a challenge, and it made my science stronger because it was good to have that level of peer review and to have that knowledge, that accumulated knowledge of all those people helping to make my projects better. And that research really did make a big difference. Um, these NWRI-funded projects and the input that came from the research advisory boards made the research stronger. And so back in the late 1990s and early 2000s, we started publishing our data on steroid hormones in wastewater treatment plants and in recycled water and in treatment wetlands. And then after that, we started our work on uh, NDMA formation and its presence in uh, recycled water systems and ways of preventing its formation. And I think those projects were all stronger due to the contributions of NWRI. And after a few years of doing this research, suddenly this assistant professor was seen as an expert. And I started getting inquiries from the media, and I started being asked to give talks in front of members of the public. And one of the things that really struck me, talking to the public and talking to reporters, is how little most people know about what happens to their water when it makes the journey from its source to their tap. And so that experience of seeing a need, an unmet societal need to understand water systems, really was the inspiration that led me to spend four years writing Water 4.0. And I learned a lot in the course of writing this book. Um, I learned that water systems, modern water systems, and even ancient water systems didn't move in a linear progression as technologies improved and progress was made. They lurched from crisis to crisis. And I saw that there were three crises that had led to the development of the modern water system. And in the book, I talk about a fourth crisis that we're facing now and the outlines or the blueprints of that next water revolution. Another thing that I learned as I started working on that book is how many great ideas are out there 
about how to create this fourth revolution in urban water systems. And knowing that there are so many technologies and so many gifted people and so many dedicated people trying to make a difference makes me much more sanguine about the future of our urban water systems. But yet, as I looked at that system, as I thought about all these ideas there, I was very puzzled by the fact that there are great ideas, there's a recognized problem, but yet it's so hard to bring about change in urban water systems. And so tonight I want to tell you something about thoughts that occur to me that don't really show up in Water 4.0. They're, they're ideas that have really been forming over the past couple of years after the book's been published about how we as water professionals can bring about this fourth revolution in urban water systems. So I address my, my remarks tonight not to the lay audience and the general public that was the main target of Water 4.0, but to the water professionals in the room. And I want to try to share the knowledge that we've acquired through our interactions as part of Renew It about that process through which great ideas end up becoming a reality. And I'm hoping that by looking carefully at the system and looking at the mechanism through which change occurs, we can all change a little bit our actions and try to make this path to change happen more quickly. But before I start telling you about the path to change, I think I need to go back and revisit some of the drivers of change in urban water systems. And to me, the biggest driver for change in the long term is climate change. That is the emerging picture of the long term effects of climate change on urban water systems really makes me recognize that our existing linear system of imported water and uh, its use and, and disposal instead of reuse is just not something that we're going to be able to support in the future. Let me give you an example of some of the ways in which I think climate change will drive the fourth revolution in urban water. This is a figure from the 2013 uh, IPCC report that I had the cover of on the previous slide. And it's kind of a complicated figure. Most of the time we don't look at graphs which tell us uh, units of percent per degree centigrade. But if you stick with this figure, it's actually pretty enlightening. So this figure tells us what's predicted to happen by the, most, the latest generation of climate models to mean, average, uh, mean annual precipitation in different parts of the world. So it's scaled for the change that's going to happen for each degree centigrade of warming. So as we go through the 21st century, we predict that the planet's going to warm, and as the planet warms, the hydrologic cycle changes. And the hydrologic cycle changes by introducing more water into the atmosphere, but also through changes in weather patterns and ocean currents. And the moral of this figure is that the wet places are going to get wetter and the dry places are going to get drier. So all the places on this map that are shown in different shades of blue are the places that are going to get wetter as the planet warms, and all the places shown in tan or orange are the places that are going to get drier. And so what you can see here is that Australia, the southern part of Africa, much of South America, much of the Mediterranean, and much of North America, especially the Southwest and, uh, and Mexico, are going to become drier as the planet warms. And this is something that has a big impact on our water resources. I'm not saying that any one drought period can be tied to the effects of climate change, but this is a figure from the U.S. Drought Monitor. This is the status of the current drought as of October 28th, and the areas in red are the areas of most severe drought, and the areas in yellow are also in drought. And you can see here the historic drought that's hit California, and you can see the drought that is uh, putting a lot of pressure on central and western Texas, and you can see remnants of the drought that hit the Colorado River Basin. So even if this isn't caused by climate change, this is what we might expect in the future as the planet gets warmer and less rain falls. Now, rainfall is not the only effect that we would expect under climate change. Um, as Jerry Schnorr uh, eloquently explained in his 2011 Clark Prize talk, um, all of the evidence suggests that the planet's going to get warmer. And as the planet gets warmer, our hydrologic systems change. There's more evaporation and more evapotranspiration. And the patterns of water demand change. 
That is, as it gets warmer, people use more water to grow food, and people use more water in their gardens. And so that water resource and its status is going to change in a changed climate. In addition, as it gets warmer, we're going to start to lose our snowpack and our glaciers. And so in California and in the Rocky Mountains, much of our seasonal water storage occurs in snowpack. And we've engineered a system of water capture and water collection that relies upon snow falling in the mountains. And so if by the end of the 21st century that snow is no longer coming, we're going to have to re-engineer our water capture systems to capture it more effectively. Now, in California uh, or in Colorado or the Western United States, we probably have the resources to do it. There would probably be a protracted political struggle over attempts to expand dams and reservoirs and change the hydrologic cycle. But we could probably do this. But if you think about places like Bolivia, or India, the Himalayas, where that glacial snow, uh, that glacial ice and snow serves as the main uh, water infrastructure to hold water and deliver water to cities, they're going to be, there's a need for major changes. So those three things, less rainfall, lower yields of water that does fall and increase demand, and a change in the disappearance of snowpack and ice is a real stress on our urban water systems that we've designed based upon a climate that existed for the past hundred years. In addition to climate change, there's another factor pushing us towards changes in our urban water systems, and that's population. So in North America, over the past 50 years, the population has migrated to the places where there's the least water. So this figure shows you these, these funny little blocks on the figure are counties. And the height of each of these irregularly shaped blocks is the population on a county level in the United States. And the other thing that I've done in this figure is I've listed the names of the 20 largest metropolitan areas in the United States. And so the areas shown in blue are counties where the population has been decreasing and will decrease in the future. That is, this is a, a map that shows you population from 1970 to 2030. And so the areas in blue show shrinking populations, and the areas in red and orange show places where population is growing. So people are moving to the southeast, the southwest, and the south, and those are the places where there just may not be enough water. So I took the liberty here of highlighting the names of the different metropolitan areas in red or, or um, I guess it's looking black on my screen, black, um, to indicate whether I thought that they were going to run into water stress in the future. And all the ones in the southern half of the U.S. are places where I know by experience that an increase in, um, in uh, population may not be something that the water supply can sustain. Um, if you think about it, these cities are growing by a few percent per year. And so over a period of 20 or 30 years, um, the population is going to grow by uh, 30 or 50 percent. And even though we might be able to institute water conservations or reduce measures or reduce water demand, that those improvements are going to be soaked up by this increase in population. We can also cast our eye a little further afield and look at other cities in the world and see an increased stress in their ability to provide water supply for their populations. So I've listed here Mexico City, Sao Paulo, uh, New Delhi, Perth, and Singapore as, uh, as cities. And these seem like a pretty disparate group of cities to be thinking about. But these are all cities where a combination of climate change and population increases really call into question the future of their urban water supply. So in Mexico City, we see uh, groundwater mon mining and an unsustainable uh, path to providing water in a city that continues to grow. Uh, Sao Paulo, the last time I looked at the, uh, the website that showed the main reservoir for the city of Sao Paulo, it was below 3%, and people are predicting that Sao Paulo will run out of water sometime this month. 
Um, in New Delhi, that's a place where population continues to grow, and I think we could say of all of the major Indian cities that there's great water stress and a need for finding another way of providing people with water. So it's not just New Delhi, but it's, uh, it's places like Chennai that run out of water every once in a while. In Perth, a change in the uh, water, the, the water circulation patterns has led to a decrease in rainfall, and that's inspired the city to make major investments in seawater desalination. And we're at a point now where about half of Perth's water, drinking water supply comes from seawater desalination plants. And in Singapore, a city that's known for its thoughtful investments in urban water systems, um, they had the, drought, the driest February on record um, um, last year, or this year, I guess that's this year, and it's called into question some of the things that even Singapore has done to provide for a future water supply. So you can see that these twin threats of population growth and climate change uh, really do give us a motivation to think about reinventing our water systems. Now with respect to climate change, um, people in our field have, uh, have been pretty quiet about climate change and its impact on urban water systems. We've been willing to accept that there's a great deal of uncertainty about climate change and its likely impact on urban water systems. But I think a thoughtful analysis of the most recent data on climate change predictions suggests that we can no longer claim that we don't know which direction the story's going in. So why do we sometimes see reticence on the part of water resources planners to more precisely plan for the effects of climate change? Sometimes it's because we're engineers and we just want to get a job done. We don't want to cause waves, and for many of the politicians making hard decisions, they don't want to antagonize uh, political constituencies who might think that climate change is something that we don't talk about. Um, that's the only way I can understand a 300-page report that plans out the future of a state's water supply with barely a mention of climate change. So this 2012 Texas Water Development Board report on climate change talks about climate change in a few pages, talks about it as a problem that we don't know enough about and that we can plan for after the science is established. And I think as professionals, it's time for us to recognize that this is a design constraint, climate change. And if there's uncertainty, good engineers plan for uncertainty by building things differently to account for the possible impacts of that change and tell managers that this is something that we need to deal with soon. So I think we're reaching a point where as professionals we have a true obligation not just to plan for climate change but make it clear that it would be professionally irresponsible not to design urban water systems for climate change. Now, turning to the issue of how we're going to reinvent urban water systems, um, there's no drought when it comes to good ideas for reinventing urban water systems. As part of my work in the Renewit Center, it's been a real pleasure to work with people like Dick Luthi and Jurg Dravis from Colorado School of Mines, who was one of the other uh, founders of Renewit, and a really talented group of students at uh, Berkeley, Stanford, Colorado School of Mines, and New Mexico State University in thinking about this next generation of urban water systems. So whether it's wastewater treatment plants that are producing all the energy that they need to operate and maybe then some, or it's aquifers that are equipped with sensors that can operate managed aquifer recharge projects um, in a way that's much more precise than the existing projects, which are just kind of throw it in the ground and see what happens. Or if it's the design of uh, housing developments that employ distributed water treatment systems that truly allow them to be off the grid. All of these are wonderful ideas that have tremendous potential to give us a fourth revolution in urban water systems. But I look around and in many places I see the kinds of water systems that are being built and they're indistinguishable from the water systems that were being built 50 years ago. And I say to myself, why is that? 
why do we still employ technologies that we don't think are going to be able to get us through the next hundred years when there are all these great ideas out there that might allow us to do things better. And I could think of a number of reasons why that should be. First of all, um, I have to recognize that you know, this field and the people in this field have a reputation of being some of the most conservative people in the world. And we are conservative for many good reasons. We're conservative because we're fierce protectors of public health and we don't like to take risks on public health. We're conservative because this is a field where there's a low return on investment. And that low return on investment means that um, it's not a place where new ideas find a lot of support. We're a field where projects get built based upon bond funding uh, and that projects are designed to last for a hundred years. And so there's a real hazard in making a mistake in building an urban water system. And so for these reasons and many others that we've studied as part of our, our research, we see that there's a need to think about ways to make these technologies diffuse out into practice more quickly. And in thinking about the ways in which the technologies that have made the jump from the laboratory or pilot scale to actually being used in practice, uh, the way in which that happens, I find a lot of inspiration in the work of Denny Parker, who's here with us tonight. Um, this is a figure that comes from a paper that Denny published in 2011 in Water Environment Research, which refers to something that's called an S-curve. And so this S-curve shows the number of units installed of a different technology uh, as a function of time. And this is a curve that was first thought about in the development of consumer products and medical technology and all kinds of other uh, types of new ideas that have a much shorter time scale. And so if you think about a cell phone, the initial development of a new technology for a cell phone um, through its demonstration and uptake by consumers occurs over a period of three to five years. And then the next model of the cell phone is, um, is actually installed or, or is sold to people. When we think about urban water technologies, the x-axis on this figure or the amount of time that it takes is something on the order of 30 or 40 years. So let me walk you through this, this, uh, this figure a little bit because it's had a lot of impact on the way in which we at Renew It think about taking our technologies from the laboratory and bringing them out into practice. So the first thing that happens on the left-hand side of this figure is that someone comes up with a good idea. And that good idea gets out of the laboratory and built at the pilot scale. So maybe something the size of this stage that I'm on. And then it, it still works. And so someone builds it at a demonstration scale, maybe the size of a small treatment plant somewhere. And at that point, someone who we, we call an innovator decides that this is a good idea and they want one of their own and they want to pay for it, they want to invest in it, and they want it to serve a purpose that no other technology that exists can serve. That innovator then inspires a group of people called early adopters. And those early adopters see the success of the innovative system and they decide it's worth taking a risk. And so we often say in the water infrastructure field that the folks in the information technology field, in the electronics field, they're me first people. And in the water infrastructure field, we're me too people. We wait for someone else to do it and we say, oh, me too, I'll take one of those. Those are the early adopters. And then the early adopters um, build a few of those and then the design engineers and decision makers um, say, you know, you could do it this way or you could do that new idea that I heard about someone else doing. And then very rapidly the number of units of this new technology that are installed grows till the point that you get an early majority and a late majority adopting the technology and finally the only ones who don't have it are the laggards, the ones who come later. And when we see this, this pattern, this S-curve techno of technologies uh, repeating over and over in different kinds of technologies as Denny showed for nutrient removal, we think about how we might apply this idea to the development of technologies in the Renewit Research Center. So I'll give you an example 
of a technology that uh, Craig Criddle and, uh, and Brian Cantwell and their doctoral student, Yanev Shearson, developed. It's called the CANDU process, uh, coupled aerobic anoxic nitrogen destruction operation. Oh, I'm so glad I could remember that. <laughs> I just know it as can do, and that's all you have to know. It's an innovative way to use the nitrogen in wastewater to enhance the amount of energy produced during biogas combustion. And Yaniv worked on this as part of his uh, PhD thesis, and then he won a business plan competition that allowed him to build a pilot scale facility. And then that pilot scale facility inspired a group of utilities to build this at a demonstration scale as part of the Renewit project. So right now, we're at this left-hand side of the S-curve for innovation with the CANDU process, and we're hoping that we can move to these first applications and this second generation and finally widespread adoption of the technology. So the CANDU process was the first process out of the gates at Renewit. We have about a half dozen other technologies that are marching along the S-curve, and I think what's most instructive about knowing something about the S-curve is seeing that this process of technology diffusion moves and can be helped by deliberate planning of how to pair up researchers with the uh, uh, early adopters and then publicize those first successful demonstration projects to the people who might recommend that more of these things be built in the future. Now in some ways the can-do process was easy because it was replacing existing technologies, it was complementing the existing efforts that people make in biogas combustion. What about the technologies that require a bigger change in behavior and more risk? I told you that we're a risk-averse community. How do we get those other technologies to be taken up? Well, as part of our research in Renewit, we established a project uh, with um, uh, Bernhard Trufer and Christian Binz at AVOG and uh, Sasha Harris Lovett and Mike Kaparski at Berkeley to study potable water reuse and the uh, way in which projects manage to be not only successful technologically, but embraced by their community. So anyone who's read Water 4.0 or who's been in Southern California for the last 20 years know that there are some potable water reuse projects that go down in flames. They go down in flames based upon uh, a public not accepting them. And there are other potable water reuse projects that are accepted and even embraced by the community. And we sought to understand why this should be. And the lesson that we learned, we learned from Orange County Water District and the Groundwater Replenishment Project and before it, the Water Factory 21 Project. What we learned from this project is that it's not enough to hire consultants to produce a nice website or a nice brochure that uses just the right language and shows the right images. If you want a community to embrace and accept a technology, you have to create legitimacy. And we refer to this framework of the uh, creation of legitimacy as, uh, as the means of realizing new technology adoption and diffusion, especially in the area of potable water reuse. And we see this very much like the way in which air transportation uh, became legitimate to the public. So I don't know how many of you, probably most of us aren't old enough to know about it, but if you read about the early days of air transportation, it was a dangerous endeavor, and it was a new technology that the public didn't necessarily trust. And so the air transportation industry created a safety culture that was more than just using the right words to explain why air traffic was desirable and safe. It was a way of creating a system and changing the institutions that existed before to make sure that safety was taken seriously. And when we look at the actions of Orange County Water District and what differentiates them from potable water reuse projects that failed, we see that a lot of that difference comes from the fact that they changed their institution. They increased the amount of transparency in their activities, they engaged the public, and they changed the attitudes of their managers about the way in which a new technology is implemented. 
And so I think that this is particularly important not only to assure the acceptance of a technology, but also to protect the public health of people because the managers at Orange County Water District responsible for the groundwater replenishment project are not afraid to tell management when they see a situation that may not be safe for public health. And they're not afraid to take actions to correct problems and they generally don't sweep things under the carpet just to be able to go home on Friday afternoon. So that's an example of one technology which was a little harder to get out than, oh, I should show a picture. Oh, there's a picture of Christian and, uh, and Sasha uh, and Mike Marcus at the Orange County Water District and they're drinking recycled water from the groundwater replenishment project and that's part of communicating with the public and starting this dialogue about uh, potable water reuse by letting the public experience uh, exactly what the water tastes like. There's another challenge for the diffusion of new technologies that we've encountered in Renewit, and that is uh, when new technologies are, um, are radically different and challenge the existing business model. And um, this is a, a figure of a report that I had the, uh, the good fortune of participating in. Um, Kala was one of the instigators of this project along with the people at uh, the Water Environment Federation and uh, and the Johnson Foundation, but we got together and talked about integrated or distributed water systems. And I think that many people in our field see great potential of distributed treatment systems to uh, reduce the energy consumption in water systems, to make them more resilient and responsive, and to allow us to grow and shrink water infrastructure as cities grow and expand. Uh, grow and contract, rather. Um, and that's a really good thing. I think we heard a talk about that today and saw the potential for distributed uh, treatment systems to change urban water infrastructure. But a lot of the distributed water systems that are being studied now are being studied because they're a means of handling wastewater. So they're either being studied as a way of reducing combined sewer overflows or they're being studied as a way of saving energy. Personally, I think that's a great thing, but when I think about the challenge that takes up most of my time and occupies many of the people in this room, I don't see membrane bioreactors in the basement of an office building to clean water so that you could flush toilets that are becoming ever more efficient as a means of expanding our urban water supply. I think that distributed water systems have great potential if we can figure out ways in which they can provide us with drinking water. And in the early days of Renewit, we started working on a project, I think Jörg Dravis instigated a project where we'd look at point of entry treatment systems that would take uh, recycled water or roof water or stormwater runoff and treat it to a point where it could be used as a drinking water supply within a house. And when we told our science advisory board about this idea, um, they kind of shook their heads and said, no, I don't think that the public's ready for this. And they encouraged us to go back and talk to our industrial advisory board members and other people in the community. And we learned that this idea, which might someday transform distributed water systems by not only allowing us to dispose of wastewater, but to recycle the water as a drinking water supply, that it's not quite ready to diffuse up the S-curve yet. And so we went back to the drawing board and thought about other markets for point of entry and point of use water systems where we might make a difference and develop a technology which then could later transition into this application that we'd envisioned. And so in my group we've been involved in a research project to create a distributed or point of entry uh, advanced oxidation process. And for us, the key to this process, uh, which is a UV peroxide advanced oxidation process, was to be able to generate the hydrogen peroxide from oxygen in the air. Because if you have a network of distributed advanced oxidation treatment plants around, you don't want to be driving trucks around and reloading hydrogen peroxide into a reservoir. And so working with uh, James Barazesh and Tom Hannibal, Tom's here tonight, we've developed a way of using electrochemistry to take the oxygen in room air and create hydrogen peroxide on demand and then pass that hydrogen peroxide through a UV lamp 
and then use an anode to scavenge any residual hydrogen peroxide. And we can do this for about the same energy cost um, or EEO for those of you in the know like Rhodes um, that the Orange County Water District's uh, groundwater replenishment project uses. But the advantage here is that instead of treating all of the water that goes out on people's lawns or uh, gets used to flush toilets to this drinking water quality, we only treat the water that comes into the house. That's an example of our strategy for diffusing a technology, create the technology for a different application. So in this case, we're using this technology for wellhead treatment of contaminated groundwater and, uh, and treatment of water that where people have a drinking water supply uh, that has low levels of something like a pesticide or something like that. And eventually, we see a role for this to diffuse into distributed treatment systems. Now, I want to turn my attention now to another area where we see a technology that has great potential to improve urban water systems that needs a little help in diffusing, and that's the use of natural systems. So a river can move water from place to place just as well as a pipe, and an aquifer or a lake can store water as well or better than a reservoir and a sand filtration system or a sand, riverbank filtration system or soil aquifer treatment system can purify water with natural processes as it passes into the ground. And a wetland can improve water quality through the microbial processes happening on the surface of plants. And I want to use the example of constructed treatment wetlands to show you the evolution that's occurred in the use of managed natural systems to treat water and be part of urban water infrastructure. So prior to the 1950s, we considered wetlands to be swamps, things to be drained, places where you could dump things. But starting in the 1960s, people realized that wetlands provide ecosystem services. They could act as the kidneys of our water system, and they could filter water and purify water. So starting in that time period, the first generation of um, ecologists who were interested in creating treatment wetlands started their work. And they built wetland systems to treat agricultural runoff. They built wetland systems to treat uh, wastewater effluent to polish it. They built wet wetlands to treat uh, industrial runoff. But they were inspired by the ideas of how a natural system should function, and so they were very much influenced by the idea of ecological self-design. So the general philosophy supporting the early wetlands was uh, punch a hole in a dike, let the water flow in, let the plants grow, and the water will be purified, because that's how nature does it. And this kind of wetland, this kind of first-generation wetland, provided some wonderful habitat because that self-design is the key in many cases to creating biodiversity. But when it came time to look at the ability of these wetlands to improve water quality by removing pollutants, these wetlands often came up short. And that was because in a natural system, if you let water pass into a wetland, it will find the easiest path through the wetland. It will create a channel. And so the second generation of people interested in improving wetlands called themselves ecological engineers. They were people like Robert Cadlick who applied the idea of unit processes and reactor design to avoid that short circuiting problem. And they were able to create wetlands that did a much better job removing contaminants. Or people like my UC Berkeley colleague, Alex Horn, who sought to understand the microbial communities responsible for breaking down the decaying plants and improving water quality. And with this second generation of uh, treatment wetlands, they were able to reliably remove nitrate from water. They were able to uh, remove organics and, uh, and improve water quality. And it became very popular to start building little treatment wetlands. And you go around the country and you'll see wastewater treatment plants that have a little polishing wetland behind the facility to improve water quality. I think that's great. I think it's wonderful. But I think the real potential of managed constructed wetlands is to be able to treat extremely large volumes of water that contain relatively low concentrations of contaminants. And the first case where I really saw this being put into action was uh, 
I guess about 30 miles from here on the Santa Ana River in the Prado wetlands. So starting about 25 years ago, the Orange County Water District started to recognize that the water coming down the Santa Ana River had nitrate concentrations that endangered their drinking water supply. That is, the nitrate levels flowing down the Santa Ana River from the wastewater treatment plants upstream and the agricultural runoff were too high to use as a drinking water supply. And what they did was they partnered with Alex Horn and they re-examined their Prado wetland system and they embraced this idea of avoiding hydraulic short circuiting and choosing the right kinds of plants to grow up a system that was capable of removing nitrate. And with that system, they treated about half the flow of the Santa Ana River and reduced the nitrate concentrations to a point where the water was safe to drink. Now, when I first started getting interested in steroid hormones and pharmaceuticals and nitrosamines uh, uh, back in the late 1990s, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great if we could use something like the Prado wetlands to remove these trace organic compounds? And so one of my first PhD students, James Gray, studied the ability of these kinds of wetlands to remove steroid hormones from, uh, from the Santa Ana River water. And what we found was that these wetlands, which were so good at removing nitrate and other contaminants, were pretty bad when it came time to remove an exotic trace organic compound like ethanyl estradiol or 17 beta estradiol. But we weren't discouraged, or at least I wasn't discouraged. James just graduated. But I wasn't discouraged about this. I said, there's got to be another way to do this. And we recognize by taking a step back that maybe we didn't need a vegetated wetland at all. Maybe we could take advantage of the ability of sunlight to break down these trace organic contaminants. And so working again with Alex Horn, uh, we created a new kind of wetland system that really isn't a wetland system at all. This figure which Dick showed uh, in his introduction is what we call our open water unit process system. What it is essentially is a geotextile liner which prevents wetland plants from rooting and a series of boards in this case to assure that we don't get hydraulic short circuiting. And we feed the wastewater effluent in on one side and we let the sunlight penetrate through the water and break down the contaminants. And so with that sunlight, we're able to break down many of the pharmaceuticals and personal care products that we're interested in studying. Um, and my colleague, Cara Nelson, and her student, Mi Nguyen, has, have studied the ability of these systems to inactivate waterborne pathogens, because we all know that if you shine sunlight on uh, water long enough, you'll inactivate uh, viruses and bacteria, and we see four logs of removal over a period of a couple of days in this system. So this is a system that's really good at removing uh, trace organics that are susceptible to photochemical transformation and inactivating waterborne pathogens. Um, the student who was responsible for this project, uh, Justin Jasper, was really surprised when he saw that the algae and bacteria that accumulate in the bottom of this wetland system also break down trace organic contaminants and also remove nitrate. So this system, which um, is often supersaturated with oxygen, has uh, microaerophilic -air zones that are able to remove nitrate by denitrification and remove nitrate uh, through the Animox process. And so this system, this simple uh, noble system here, has a hydraulic residence time of, uh, of two or three days, gets us better removal of trace organic contaminants, microbes, and nitrate than the wetland system that we'd studied in, uh, in the Prado wetlands that had a residence time of about a week. And so with that information about the way that this pilot scale system worked, we approached the Orange County Water District and convinced them to build a demonstration scale system. So this is an aerial photo of the demonstration scale system that we built about um, 14 months ago in the Prado wetlands. And just to give you an idea of scale, this picture was taken from a Cessna. And each of these little parallel runs here, the, uh, the soil in between, those, those gray areas, you can drive a pickup truck across. So this is really, truly a system at demonstration scale. And for the past 16 months, we've been studying this system and its ability to remove trace organics. And so you can see we worked our way 
up the S-curve from laboratory experiments that showed the potential to use photochemistry to remove these contaminants to pilot scale studies to now a demonstration scale. And we're excited about the idea of diffusing this out to the community and are currently looking for other, uh, others who'd like to build similar kinds of systems. So, um, you know, being here and receiving the Clark Prize, that's a great personal honor. Um, but really, it's, uh, it's not an honor that just falls to me alone. Um, I think that I tried to show in this brief talk some of the places where my colleagues at Renewit and my students and the collaborating utilities have contributed to this work. And I wish they could all be up here and share the podium with me, um, but then the talk would be a little incoherent. Um, <laughs> But, um, you know, seriously, um, I don't think it, um, it would have been possible to do this without a very large team of people involved in it. And so I listed the names of some of the people at UC Berkeley and in parentheses the ones that have left. I show you where they've gone to indicate that these people have gone out and uh, cross-pollinated uh, with the rest of the uh, academic and professional world. But they come from UC Berkeley, they come from Stanford, they come from Colorado School of Mines, uh, New Mexico State, and, and AVOG ETH Zurich. And, um, and they've been instrumental to the success of this work and an inspiration to me. There are also the funding organizations. Uh, you know, NWRI was the place I got started and, and had faith in me to fund some of my first work. Some of this work was done through uh, support from WERF and the Paul Bush Award. And, uh, and much of the work has been done through individual investigator grants from National Science Foundation and later on through Renewit. Um, plus, I just show you the town of Discovery Bay and Orange County Water District because they're the ones who really took a risk on building the open water unit process wetlands. Um, I'd also like to really, you know, I guess it's not possible to give my thanks because he's no longer with us, but Ron Linsky, the founding executive director of NWRI, was someone who took a chance on me uh, when I had some things to tell water managers that weren't particularly po uh, popular. I remember the looks I got when I told people that the recycled water might have things in it that weren't good to drink. And Ron stood behind me and convinced the group that this was something that we really had to get ahead of. And so this group of people and many others who I interact with are what the social scientists call an innovation ecosystem. And an innovation ecosystem is a social endeavor. It's a cross-fertilization of ideas. It's a sharing of ideas. It's a progression of different roles that we all play in a community. And I feel particularly fortunate to be part of a an innovation ecosystem that has its roots in California and California culture. Because what I've found in this innovation ecosystem that I'm part of is that we have a state and a way of thinking that encourages people to take risks and rewards them for it. We have people who take seriously threats to public health and the future of our planet. And we have people who are um, creative thinkers and are inspired by all the technological innovations going on around them. And I think as a scientist and a researcher who spent the first part of their life squirreled away in a laboratory, toiling away on what they thought were really cool projects, it's been an eye-opening experience to see the role that we all can play in advancing this remarkable system that is urban water infrastructure. Thank you very much.